Hello everybody and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. We're coming at you live from Hoss Tools headquarters here in Norman Park, Georgia. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. We've got a great show for you today. On today's show we're talking about cut flowers, growing flowers in your garden. Usually we talk just about growing your own food, but we'll talk about something that can complement that food today. And as usual, we'll have our show and tell segment, our tool of the week, and then answer some of you guys' questions from last week. So, um, excited. We've got a great show today for you. Hope you enjoy it. And uh, the very last of the tomato sandwiches is a sad day. Sad day? Yeah, I'm even having to eat them with in bread. Yeah. It's tough times. Time's getting hard. Yeah. yeah. I'm telling you, I've eaten a bunch of them this year and I've enjoyed them, but this is one of the very last ones. It's probably going to be the last one I have. So we yeah. won't see you eating any more no, batter sandwiches unless, on the show. unless I slip off somewhere and get me some from up north. This is this going to wind up. I just don't care about eating a made of sandwich from them coming out the grocery store. Right, yeah. I just pulled mine up yesterday. They was looking pitiful. I actually did a, um, got a two-minute tip coming next week on how I pull them up and how I get rid of them and all that. So keep your eye out for that. But uh, mine were those leaf-footed bugs and the... The disease had just, I couldn't stand to look at them looking pitiful no more, no longer. Yeah, down where we live, that fast of Fourth July, you just pretty much give it up. Yeah, yeah. So we just, uh, we're going to try some ones in the high tunnel. Uh, experiment. Experiment, doing some uh, long trellising mm -hmm. on the strings, what they call the lower and lean technique. We're going to try that this fall, but we got to wait on it to cool off a little bit yes, before we, we get into that. All right. So, uh, on our show and tell segment this week, because the garden's a little slow, I do want to talk about fall potatoes. So, we've never grown fall potatoes, but... I'll be honest with you, I've never heard of growing fall potatoes, but our buddy Greg tells us we can do it. Our buddy Greg at Irish Eyes, where we get our seed potatoes from, they way up there in Washington State. Most of all, you, you seed potato growers in northern climates, you got... Greg and then my Irish eyes in Washington State, and then you got Jim Garrison, who's in uh, Maine with Prairie Wood Prairie Farm. Wood Prairie, and they're in Maine. So most of your organic seed potato growers way up north, which kind of it is diff makes difficult for us down here getting the seed potatoes because they're on a completely different cycle than we are. Yeah. Anyway, so Greg told us last time we talked to him that we should be able to grow fall potatoes, but we've never seen anybody try it around here. Um, so he said it would work. So we, uh, I talked to him the other day to see if they had any seed left, and they are about out. He's got two varieties. He's got a Yukon Gold left, and he's got a, um, a variety called Chieftain, which is a red potato. Uh, so we got 200 pounds. I think 100 pounds, 100 pounds of these Yukon Golds on the way. Now the problem, well it ain't a problem, but something we're gonna have to work through is these potatoes he's sending us already got about an inch of spud or uh, growth on them there. They could be planted tomorrow, but we don't really need to plant them until about the end of August. Okay, so we're in zone eight. Yeah. And we plant them at the end of August, and well, they're 70 days somewhere there. Uh huh. And that's going to throw them coming off when? Probably middle October sometime. Okay. Now, we could actually probably get by with planting them a little later than that, but we're doing this for our test garden at Sunbelt Expo, and that show is in October, so we're kind of planning according to that. You could probably zone that, get by planting them a little bit later, and have them come in the first of November if you wanted to. Right. And uh, that 70 days is going to be sped up by those heat units a yep. little bit. Uh, so that's why I said middle of October. So with all that being said, if you want to grow fall potatoes, because I doubt you're going to find any at your local feed, seed and feed uh, store. If you want to order them. If you want to grow some fall potatoes, you live in a warmer climate, you better get on the phone with Irish Eyes. They only got several hundred pounds left of these things. Yep. So get on the phone with them and, and get those, and just, you can just put them in the refrigerator. What's the what's the ideal storage temp for? Ideal storage temperature for a seed potato is between 35 and 39 degrees with 90% humidity. And that's ideal. So just get the best you can within there. But from 35 to 39 degrees is ideal. So go ahead and order you some. Keep them in a cool place. 
wait a month or two and plan them, and you yep. should be good to go. So, just a just a heads up. Gonna be there. interesting how this turns out. Yes, yeah, so we're gonna plant a plot at the expo for our demo garden, and we'll talk about our, our how that whole deal at the expo on a later show. And then while I'm gonna plant some in my garden, and we'll try it out and see. All right, and then um, for our tool of the week this week, we want to do a little teaser. So this is not an actual tool that we have on our site yet. It's something we've been working on. So these are an old tool that Planet Junior used to make years ago, and we're trying to replicate them best we can. And they call them wing foot. Well, so we're gonna call I don't them. know. I'm not sure what the Planet Junior catalog called them. We're calling them wing sweeps. Wing sweeps. And so we've got them here in a six inch and a four inch version. And so the, the kind of origination of this, we had a lot of people asking for a four inch version of our oscillating hoe. And that may seem easy, but it's not quite as easy to manufacture as you might think. So we started looking at making a four inch version of these. And what we basically are doing here is taking our cultivator teeth. Now these aren't powder coated yet. They would be on the final yeah, these version. are these are prototypes. Prototypes. So we take a cultivator tooth and we weld it to this kind of sweet blade here. And then CNC sharpen them, so they're very sharp and they're very consistent on the angle there. And then they have these wings here, which are going to help kind of pull up those weeds as you go along. And these are at kind of an angle, so. They're going to point down into the soil. They'll level out a little bit once you lower that wheel hook yeah. into the dirt. But we did some preliminary testing with these guys, and these are some bruisers. They will yeah. rip right through. We had some pretty hard, crusty stuff, some heavy residue stuff, and it ripped right through them. They're really, really strong. Yep. Yeah. Now, these are going to be cultivating tools. This is not clear new ground. So right. We do have people occasionally try to clear new ground with our wheel hoe, and it's just not meant for that. This is cultivating tools, and these things work great because they got a little kick to them. When you put them in the ground and they get in there with a sharp edge, they cut the weeds off and then got a little kick to them coming out on the back end there. Really impressed with them so far. So we're trying to get these in production real quick. We hope to have them out soon. Yeah, and for our customers that have harder soils or heavy weed pressure where those sweeps aren't quite strong enough for them, these are going to be perfect. Yeah. Um, we'll probably end up, we don't have a price on them yet, but we'll sell these in sets of three. So you'll get uh, three of these six inch ones or three of the four inch ones. And you're going to have a lot of versatility here as far as the range. Yeah, you can move these things around on your toolbar and make any kind of, uh, I mean, you can step them back, step them up. You can do a lot of different things with them. Well, you can use one at a time, two, yeah. three. They'll hook up just like our cultivator teeth do. And so we're really excited about those wing sweeps. We think they're gonna be a hit. Yep. And um, just keep up with our email newsletter list. Usually when we come out with a new product, that's the uh, kind of the first way we let people know. So we're going there. to a meeting and couple three weeks and rumor says old Bruce from Dixondale Farms is going to be there and uh, we may be able to hook him up on our show. That's right so um, nothing finalized yet but uh, we're planning on or trying to plan on having doing an interview with Bruce at a meeting we'll be at a, a top secret meeting of the minds here in a few <laughs> weeks <laughs> uh, doing a little interview with Bruce and then we'll roll that interview on our show and, yeah. uh, following following the incident. Bruce has been growing onions a long time there at Dixondale Farms and he's a wealth of information on a lot of this. You know, a lot of things I didn't know. I didn't know about the long day, the short day. They're even growing some leeks now, I believe. So mm -hmm. we may even get into some of that. Some things that I'm not real aware of or real keen up on. We can kind of pick Bruce's mind and find out there. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, and we, we know a decent amount about the short day onions that we grow. I don't know anything about those intermediate or long day yeah. varieties. So Bruce can, for those of you that live a little further up north, Bruce yeah. will be able to provide some good information on that. Bruce and them also grow a heap of cantaloupes. Mm -hmm. And uh, he might be able to provide some, some helpful information on growing some cucurbits like those cantaloupes and stuff like that. Yeah. So, Stay tuned for that. Uh, that should be on the way in the next few weeks. All right, so getting in today's show. Today's show, we're going to talk about cut flowers. Mm -hmm. And if any of you seen my uh, two-minute tip that comes out every Tuesday, our two-minute tip yesterday was about planting cut flowers. And uh, on that tip, I showed you how I like to plant mazenias. 
I put them on drip tape and then do little two little a double row on each side there. And those are actually starting to come up now. I noticed the other day we had a little rain over the weekend. Those are starting to sprout. Once those get about a foot tall, we'll probably do another two minute tip. There's a certain way you can trim those things um, to keep them getting so leggy on you and, and needing some support. Yeah. So. Well, let's talk about cut flowers just for a minute, just a generalization of cut flowers. I like to grow them in my garden. Now, I'm kind of a man, I consider myself to be a man. I mean, you gotta be secure in your manhood to be able to grow cut flowers, but just cause you grow cut flowers don't, don't mean anything. You can, uh, we like to grow cut flowers in the garden, and there's several reasons why. It adds a little color out there. It adds a little pollination, helps your pollinators come in there. And who knows, you know, you may get in a tight, have to have you a bouquet of flowers pretty quick. You may have messed up somewhere along the lines and, and you can run out there and get those and give them to the wife and kind of smooth things over. You may be your Sunday at church to have flowers and you can go out there yeah. and get them. So we always like to have some cut flowers. Going. I personally just in group, enjoy growing cut flowers. Or, and I've had this happen to me before, your buddy might mess up. Your buddy may, that's right. And uh, he might have to slide over to the house and you might have to loan him some flowers so he can get everything situated yeah. in his house. You'll be like the go-to man for everybody that what messes up. So yeah. it, it's good to have cut flowers out there. We're going to give you some advice today, I hope, that can help you grow cut flowers because there's some tricks and tips out there. And I've struggled way back in the day growing cut flowers, and I think I kind of got it under control now. But we're going to try to help people today understand the easiest and the best way to grow cut flowers. That's right. And so... There's three main ones that we grow here. We grow the zinnias, we grow the sunflowers, and we have we don't do it every year, but we grow the celosia or the coxcomb. Yeah, and the reason we grow those is because they're the easiest ones to grow, and you get the most bang out of your butt for growing these three varieties. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions out there of people growing marigolds in the garden, and that's going to help for insects and things like that. I think that's a myth. I got my own thoughts on that. But marigolds do not grow real good in the garden. They have some problems. Uh, these three varieties right here are easy to grow. They grow well in the garden, and you get a lot from them. So, so that's the ones we like to grow. And they, they, they do well in the heat, and you can plant them almost any time. It's not like there's a certain window you can plant them. You know, usually I would like to have my zinnias already planted, but. I was a little behind with some other stuff going on in the garden, so we just got them planted. Yeah, I, I, I fixed to start on my second crop of zinnias, so I've had one garden come through and we got some down at the house, but I'm fixing to plant some more. And you can grow zinnias pretty much throughout, you know, throughout the year, throughout the summer, the season. Now, one of the first books that I got a hold to that really helped me understand cut flowers a lot was this book here. And this is probably the first and the most popular book on cut flowers out there. And it is wrote by a lady named Lynn. I think you say her last name, Bozinski. Yeah. Well, Lynn has somewhat semi-retired. The last time I talked with Lynn was in Kansas. She was accepting an award out there. And she told me she was kind of stepping back a little bit. But she's got a few books out there. And she was probably the forefront on, on leading the way on telling people a good way to grow cut flowers and what varieties to grow. Yeah, and what year was this book published? It's been a few years ago. Yeah. Now, since then, a buddy of ours named Lisa Ziegler's kind of picked up where Lynn left off. And Lisa does a great job on social media. And she has written several books. And she travels the country a lot speaking. She actually came down to our Sunbelt Expo a couple years ago. But Lisa is also part of our Robo Road Garden Group. Card carrying member. Yep, she's a card carrying member. So if you have any questions, you can always post it on our Robo Road, and Lisa will probably pick up on her head. But Lisa is a wealth of information on growing cut flowers. Now, if you think you may want to grow cut flowers for a living or to supplement your income, she has a program or a system that's down to a T on how to do that. And she's taught us a lot of things about how to prune zinnias and things like that what varieties to grow. Now this is her latest book out there and this is a really, it came out this spring. This is a great book here. It's called Vegetables Loves Flowers. She has a few other books out there. But she is very active on social media so she's easy to get in contact with. And Lisa is, does a great job. And she's just, her and her sister Suzanne are Suzanne. just sweethearts. Very easy to talk to and she's willing 
to give it, you know, give you all the information you need, and, and she's just a good person. Lisa and them live, uh, I think their farm is in Newport News, Virginia. Yeah, I tease her West Virginia. She don't like yeah. that. But she, they are from Virginia, yeah. It's, it's closer to the coast, and uh, mostly flowers, but they do grow some vegetables here and there. Yeah. If I have any questions, Lisa is my go-to. I pick up the phone, call her, and she's, she answers our questions and helps us along. She is our expert in-house on, um, on cut flowers. So let's see you, the zinnias you got growing there. So as far as zinnias go, there are several different uh, varieties out there, but the one we always grow is called the Benary Giant. And Lisa's turned us on to that variety a few years yeah. ago. So these, they call them giant. They're not super, they're not big like a sunflower, but a standard zinnia is probably half the size, a third of the size. So these make some nice uh, round flowers here, you know, four inches or so in diameter. And you can buy these seeds individually colored. You can buy just the red. There's white, orange. Um, Johnny's has even got some we grew at the Expo last year called Queen Red Lime that have some color variation on them that, that look really pretty. But we always just get the mix and, um, and grow those. Yeah, I like the mix because it gives you an opportunity to find maybe some flowers, some colors you hadn't grown before. And if you are cutting them for, you know, for bouquet or whatever, it gives you a good variety of different you know, flavors and colors there. Right. Now, I did several years ago grow a little patch of just the white ones because my wife likes just the white ones. And uh, those did really well. You, you got to be careful with those because the blemishes show up a little more on the white ones so if they get yeah. discolored or more. Yeah. Um, with zinnias, you do got to prune, they do better if you prune them a little, you know, fairly frequently. I used to prune mine about once every three weeks or so, but they'll keep making and getting bushier and, and making flowers, but you got to go in there and kind of deadhead them and prune them. So they require a little bit more maintenance because they, they're kind of a, a more of a frequent harvest as opposed to... Yeah, like the more you cut them, the more you harvest them, the better they do. The only disease is, you know, you can get rust on them, you can get powdery mildew on them. So rust and powdery mildew is probably the two diseases that you have the most trouble with. I don't have a lot of problem with insects on zinnias. No, no. They're going to bring in those uh, in the morning time when those squash blooms are open and the zinnias are looking pretty out there. You can really see the bugs. Yeah, so we out. grew some queen red lime. Right, that's the ones we grew at the expo. Yeah. Um, those are some newer colors, and I, I'm guessing they, they hybridized some stuff to get some newer colors out there, but those are really, really pretty. And uh, Johnny's has those. I don't know if anybody else has them, but that's where we got them for the expo. Yeah, there's a lot of breeding being done on zinnias, a lot of different colors out there. So I'm gonna stick with the mix for the time being. But they are a lot of uh, a lot of different flavors you can plant out there. Now, there's two different ways you can plant. You can plant by seed, or you can plant by transplant. I've done both because sometimes it's just better off for me to use transplants. The transplants seem to get a little more leggier than the seeded ones do. Mm. If I've got time and and it's the soil's warm enough and I can direct seed them, I seem my plants seem to do a little bit better than they do with transplants on zinnias. Yeah, you just have to do it by hand. Yeah. you can't plant them in a mechanical plant. No, um, the transplants like I said, we've tried that before. With the transplants, because they get leggy, you got to go in there once they start making that first flower and do some heavy pruning on them and it'll spread them out a little bit and they won't yeah. get as leggy. Right. Um, so the second one, we, we like to grow the zinnias, we talked about that, and then let's talk about sunflowers for a little bit. So, uh, you know, average, you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, get a pack of sunflower seeds. You, it's usually those real big, giant ones that get 12 foot tall or so. Um, the ones we like to grow is a variety <coughs> called Pro Cut. And there's several, many different colors out of those. And uh, they're not as easy to find as the Xenia seed are. But we get them, uh, there's a company called Geo Seed out of South Carolina. Now these are a little more pricey than your average run the mill <coughs> sunflower seeds. But uh, they work really well in our cedar and uh, great uniform size to them and get some really good production out of these. Yeah, we've talked about these pro-cut sunflowers a lot because we're big fans of them. But tell you something I did this year. So I had a plot laying out there that I was gonna use, I was gonna put a cover crop in because I, it was out of my rotation. So I was letting it set out a year. 
And I said, well, I'm going to put sunflowers out there. So I planted uh, the ProCut series out there with a planter. I didn't use any drip tape or anything because I was experimenting with just using sunflowers as a cover crop. And I'm going to tell you, that did wonderful. I just cut them down a day or two ago. But them things grew fast, and it shaded out all my weeds. And they grew up, and they kept the weed pressure down on that plot a lot. So I was impressed using those uh, sunflowers as a uh, as a as a cover crop. I planted them, I think, on three foot row space, and I planted them probably about six inches apart. Probably did wonders for your beneficial insects yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. So with the sunflowers as opposed to zinnias, that's a one-time harvest. And uh, I remember talking to Lisa. With these cut flower people, they usually harvest some sunflowers right, you can tell right when they're starting to crack open, they'll harvest them then with them long stalks on them. Um, you can get the orange ones or some red ones. Yeah, like, they have several different colors of the Pro Cut. And one great thing about the Pro Cut is this what they call pollenless. So when you do cut them, if you make a bouquet or whatever out of them, they don't drip that yellow pollen all over your tabletop. So they're real clean, and they're probably the preferred variety of the uh, people in the cut flower industry. Yeah, I, I like planting them. I like, I'll probably grow some of this fall. Some of those darker, richer colors look nice. In the yeah, if you've got a plot that you haven't got anything growing on there, I would highly recommend using those. You can try them, you know, try them on that plot there, and you don't have a lot to lose. Yeah. And then the... The last one, so it's zinnias, sunflowers, and the last thing kind of cut flower we grow is called celosia. Uh, the common name for it, people call it coxcomb. And it kind of it kind of looks like the comb on a chicken, but to me it kind of looks like a, a brain. You see these images of what a brain looks like? Yeah, it's got, brain. I, don't go with, I don't go with the chicken thing over the brain. Uh, but it's got the, these little undulations in them. The flowers on those can get a little heavy so sometimes you might we have in the past had to trellis them mm -hmm. um, but there's all different colors of those the ones the one we always get is called the chief mix yep and it's got all different colors but those are really pretty and something you don't see every day yeah well they are and they're easy to grow they're very heat tolerant they're drought tolerant uh, the only thing is they get a little top heavy, so you may have to stake them or support them some. Or harvest them small. Yeah, and actually they make a dwarf variety too, but I like the taller varieties there, but you need to support them some way or, like I said, harvest them small. So you may have some problems with them breaking off, but they're easy to grow. One thing I will say about them, they can be a tad bit invasive. They reseed like they crazy. They reseed like crazy, and you can't have them come back year after year if you wanted to plant them in a spot, say in your flower beds, and have them come back. But in a garden situation, we normally don't like them invasive because we like to rotate around. So they can become a weed. So you have to be a little bit careful with that. But these things come in all different colors and they can really make a splash. Uh, they would be on my top three uh, to grow in the garden, especially for somebody just beginning to grow cut flowers. Yeah, they're, uh, they're definitely eye-catching if you've got a market stand. Hey, and just, uh, just to segue in that real quick, like with market stand, uh, I had a buddy a couple of years ago that uh, was selling his vegetables at a farmer's market and I just wanted to, just to see how it would work and we took uh, some mason jars and put some zinnias in there and I think was uh, selling them I think five or ten dollars per mason jar and a mason jar cost you less than a dollar yeah so if you got a little market stand or whatever where well, you can grow these flowers and and uh, you'd be surprised what people be willing to, to pay for. Oh, yeah. You can, uh, so let's just give a little money. a little information on the zinnias. On the zinnias, you need a pH between 5.5 and 7, which is a pretty wide range. The zinnias are, like we talked about earlier, they're not real picky, so they're easy to grow. Your coxcomb, uh, between 6 and 6.5 is your ideal range for those. And, you know, I've never had a problem with disease on coxcomb or insect pressure. So yeah. they're, you know... Well, let's touch on something else that, uh, that a lot of people don't grow that I've had some experience with is dahlias. Now, dahlias are, are a little more temperature sensitive, right? Yeah, dahlias can be temperamental to grow, and I wouldn't recommend them for somebody starting out wanting to grow uh, cut flowers in their garden. However, they probably have the most, uh, what's the word I'm hunting for here, the prettiest colors, the most Vivacious, is that a word? Uh, vibrant, my vibrant, word. vibrant, vibrant, vibrant. Yeah. They have the most vibrant colors about any cut flower to me out there, and they come in different, several different, you know, sizes. You can get the big ones, you can get the small ones. 
but they are very complex colors and shades to them. The texture of them is probably makes some of the prettiest cut flowers that you can grow. However, there's some problems there. In our area, uh, Zone 8, we can grow them, and we can grow them all throughout the year. They, they, teen, they seem to just survive during the summertime because they don't like no hot, dry heat. They survive, and then they bloom and do well in the fall. So we seem to see ours that we planted in our flower beds, whatever. We see they just survive, maybe get a bloom here and there, but come fall, they really come out and bloom. If you're going to grow them in a garden situation, I'm going to experiment in a couple of years coming with some shade cloth. Put some shade cloth maybe in a high tunnel and grow them in there in the summertime. You can grow them two different ways. You can grow them by seeds or you can grow them by tuberous. Now, if you're very sensitive about the varieties you want to grow, to get the exact variety, you have to grow by tuber. Now, if you start growing by seed, which is the way we do, because we don't really care about growing, you know, these for the county fair or these unique varieties. We just grow by seed and they're not going to reproduce exact like the tubulars will. Now if you live up north, you can take those tubers, dig them up, and save them and plant them next year. You can't do that in our zone. They just don't do well. You may get one year out of them, but they fade by the wayside. So seeds and tubulars, if you're up north, you may want to go with tubulars, especially if you're concerned about reproducing that exact same flower. If you just want to grow some to try, I would start with seeds. That's what I do. Yeah, so dahlias are a little more temperamental. We don't grow them as often as we do the zinnias, yeah. the sunflowers. And they, and the will not, they will not take dry. you got to keep them watered. They will. Uh, they have some problems with some disease, but uh, you got to have some type of irrigation on them if you're going to grow dahlias. So put some drip on them. Yeah. All right, so uh, good discussion there on cut flowers. Make sure you... you even if it's just one little row, yeah. make some room in your garden for some cut flowers. It, uh, it'll make you smile, it'll bring in the pollinators, and even get you out of a tight with yeah. an old lady every now and then. So. Yeah. All right, let's get into our questions from last week's show. And I want you to look at this beautiful koozie that you would get if we answer one of your questions on our show. All you gotta do is send us your address to customerserviceholstools.com and we'll get you one in the mail. Yeah, so we answer your question, just send us your address and we'll get that to you. All right, so let's get into our questions here. And our first question is from Mike Henderson and uh, he's in Southeast Georgia. So he's over far. around Waycross. He actually called me the other day and we had a nice conversation. He's a great guy. Uh, used to farm a lot, but now he's just uh, trying to grow some of his own food. He's very interested in doing that. Uh, you know, growing corn, he actually seen some of the ambrosia that we was growing out in the expo last year in the fall, and that's what turned him on to it. Corn is not one of those crops that's, that's sensitive to heat a lot. So you can grow corn year-round. I mean, in the summertime, that is. Spring, summer, fall. The problem is insect pressure. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're going to grow it in the fall, you definitely going to have to be on some kind of program spraying for worms because they can get really bad this time of year. I got some uh, some field corn growing now, some Jimmy Red, and it's starting to tassel out. And I'm keeping it, the BT and the neem oil on a three day rotation, I'm keeping it sprayed over the top because I've got a pretty good bit of worm pressure. I knew I was gonna have this, so I, I anticipated it and I kept it sprayed. Sweet corn is probably worse than the field corn. Definitely gonna have to keep, keep it sprayed. Yeah, so what, we grew fall corn, fall sweet corn, mm -hmm. first time last year at our demo garden at the expo, and we planted, uh, I can't quite remember, I want to say we planted it in the August, middle of August, somewhere along yeah. there, and the corn wasn't quite ready to come expo time. We, we were picking it by about the end of October, uh, but it worked really good. We didn't have any worms in it. Well, I did Hardly. Keep, yeah, I did keep it sprayed some down there though, because that, that's kind of we have a lot of insect pressure down there that time of year. So I did keep it sprayed. So if you're gonna plant it late, I mean even my spring corn, I keep an eye on it. And I don't spray my spring corn unless I see I got a problem. But if I start seeing some issues, I start spraying it. I did I had great luck this year. But if you're gonna grow it in the fall or late summer you're going to have those issues. Yeah, and if you can wait and plant it a little later, you can 
Once you get in those cooler nights, that pressure should should reduce a little bit. Yeah, but I mean, it grows fine. The heat didn't have any, the pollination's good. The heat didn't have any effect on corn it being real hot. Got to keep, of course, we're having a wet year this year, but you got to keep the moisture to it because it's going to dry out a lot quicker in the summertime than it is in the springtime. So you got to have some way to irrigate it. If you got it on drip tape, I say go for it. Just keep eye on your insects. Yeah, and Mike did mention in his question, he said he, uh, he, he, grew this first run of corn this year first time growing on drip tape made the best corn he's ever had and we hear yeah. that from a lot of people oh, yeah. growing corn once you switch over that drip tape makes a world of difference all right and then our second question comes from jd and uh he wants to know if we have any problems with asian stink bugs here and uh said they're destroying his peaches plums and even his apple trees jd we have trouble with asian stink bugs japanese stink bugs russian stink bugs cambodian st we have trouble with all stink bugs here in the south and, and stink bugs are pretty much in the all all in the same family right and they can do some major damage and uh okra they love okra when it gets hot and dry tomatoes all of it Organically speaking, stink bugs, we went over this, it's pretty much the same as uh, squash bugs. You gotta hit them early, you gotta hit them hard, you gotta stay on top of them. Once you start getting those fuel ducts around, you're either gonna have to switch to some kind of pretty powerful conventional spray. That could be trying to, or you're just gonna have to give up on it. They're a tough one to control. Yeah, and once those adults start laying a ton of eggs, it's, yeah. uh, it, can, it can be tough. So the, the best solution we found is just to spray early spray often and, and try to get you, you you know keep it you can't completely eradicate them but keep the levels down so you can at least get your spring garden in we give it a little break during summer when those populations boom and then the, those those life cycles are just so fast during yeah, the summer yeah. you can't can't really control them and then once things yeah. slow down a little bit the temperature breaks we start back gardening again and it gets a little easier. Yeah, keep your garden nice and clean. When those plants are through with, get them out of there. That's right. Because you don't want to give the stink bugs no, no food source there. Get them out of there, try to break that rotation. Stay on top of them. If it sneaks up on you and you get a bad adult problem there, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to fight them. I'd give up and move on. I don't think it's worthwhile trying to fight them. If you get a large adult population, go on and, and try to do something different next year. Yeah, I know before I pulled up my tomatoes, I was spraying my peppers and we had all those little leaf footed bugs on our tomatoes and I had some pyrethrin in there in the tank and I just, I sprayed one of them, uh, I mean point blank and didn't even phase him. Yeah. So some of those big adults. He laughed at you. Right? Right? <laughs> <laughs> some of those, those full grown yeah. adults, they, uh, they tough. It, it, you know, the only really way to kill them is grab them and squish them. Yeah, even using some of this real high powered conventional stuff, they have a lot of issues killing those adults. So there is, it's a big issue. Right. All right. So Mike and JD, thank y'all for your questions. Yep. Send us an email and we'll, uh, get that koozie in the mail to you. Um, that's going to do it for today's show. On next week's show, we're going to talk about tillers. Tillers? We're going to switch it up a little bit. We're going to talk about some equipment, anyway. Yeah, we're going to talk about some equipment. So we we have had the, the benefit of experimenting with several different types of tillers. And, and if you if you start a new garden, you're going to have to till it somewhere. Though You may not till it ever again, but you're going to need something yep. to break that ground with. Yep. And we're going to go through some different brands. Uh, and kind of maybe talk about some historical perspective on tillers and kind of uh, give y'all our thoughts yeah. on that. Make sure you tune in. All right, we'll see you guys next week. Have a good one. Mm -hmm.